This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand. On Money Talks, we discuss money news and take your questions about personal finance. For 15 years, we've provided free financial information for Mississippians. I hope you can join me, Dr. Nancy Lotridge Anderson, co-host of Money Talks, Tuesdays at 9 a.m. or anytime on our podcast. From MPB Think Radio, this is Deep South Dining, the show all about the culture of Southern flavor and the folks that love to stir the pot. Good morning, Malcolm White with Carol Palmer. We will be your host this morning and welcome aboard. The cookbook, when done right, is more than just a collection of recipes. It can serve as a time capsule for a certain time period or as a keeper of a region's history. The Mississippi Community Cookbook Project at the University of Southern Mississippi helps preserve the stories found between the recipes. And today we will have Jennifer Branock and Andrew Haley will join us from USM to talk about the cookbook project and how history can be traced through these recipes. This is a wang dang doodle, Carol. It is sugar, sugar, honey. Sugar, honey. sugar. What's all Java that? thinking this morning? Uh, he's got he's sweets happy. on his mind. You see, yeah, he's he been does. to a couple of these uh, fall carnivals, and he's thinking. He's got candy corn on the brain. He's got candy corn. It's, it. it's almost Halloween. We're, uh, <laughs> you know, about a couple of days away, a week away or so. And uh, yeah, candy is everywhere. <laughs> you know, I was thinking about Halloween and the trick or treat thing and what it's become and what it used to be. As a child, I remember we would get whole candied apples on a stick homemade oh yeah we get these uh, popcorn caramel balls that were homemade wrapped in wax paper and we get those uh sugar i mean those uh, rice crispy cakes wrapped in individual yeah but now uh, it's grab the candy bars and run for the hills yeah, but they still have little pumpkins and candy corn, and that makes me happy, sugar, sugar. That's yeah, my good. son, he's a fan of candy corn all year round, so now is the time to stock up for us. Because <laughs> <laughs> you cannot find a candy corn outside of October. <laughs> That's a good thing. So, Carol, uh, it is fall, autumn. Choose your uh, classification. Um I was up in Greenville uh, on Friday to unveil the uh, Julia Reed writer's marker uh, in downtown Greenville. My buddy Tom Massey and I took a a road trip. And I followed your road trip all over Facebook, and I I was with you in my mind. It's the Tamale Festival in Greenville, which Julia used to run the literary mashup component of that. And uh, it's changed a little bit, but uh, we took this opportunity to erect uh, a writer's marker for Julia uh, at the Weathersby House, which is where Julia had had her bookstore before her passing. Well, it was a rightful marker. It's, you know, right that you should do so but it was a good time and all of julia's family was there and uh, again celebrating the tamale festival uh, and being october in the mississippi delta Uh, and then afterwards we had so many options afterwards there was there were these panels and there was a tamale festival going on music it was just so much going on excuse me but tom and i made the decision to get back in the car uh, after visiting the Mississippi River to see how low it was, and we drove all the way across the Delta to Greenwood. Of course you did, because you always, when when faced with panels and discussions, you're always thinking of the food first. That's right. And so we drove uh, to Fan and Johnny's, uh, the great Fan and Johnny's in Greenwood downtown, adjacent to the Viking property there on the Yazoo River. And had a delightful lunch of uh, crab meat bisque, fried catfish, fried green tomatoes, uh, bread pudding, and a great visit with Leanne Galt, whose office is just across the street from Fan and Johnny's there. And so Leanne came over and we had a visit. She was on her way to the Southern Foodways Symposium in, in Oxford. And I've invited her to call in next week and give us a report on SFA. You and I used to go oh, yeah, regularly, but we haven't time. been in a while. I know, I know. We went for the first 12, 13 years. But, you know, Leanne Galt is herself a culinarian, 
and one of the founders of Cooking Coping, Cooking and Coping, and might I say, the favorite oh, of Cooking well, and Coping. Her she, food every night, people log on just to see what Leanne cooked for dinner. That's right. And I'm sure you saw Taylor Bowen Ricketts, the, the chef, chef. Of course. We had a nice visit with Chef Ricketts. Um, and, and as we were departing Fan and Johnny's, we literally bumped in to Scott Beretta in the alley between the Viking building and Fan and Johnny's. Turns out this has become quite the hub for culture in Greenwood is this alley between Fan and Johnny's and the, and the Viking building. And Scott Beretta was telling us how during the pandemic, the alley became the gathering place because Fan and Johnny's had to close to the public, but they were serving food out there pick up window so people would come bring lawn chairs order food it would come out the window and they would sit in the alley Love and it. visit are you are you talking about ramcat alley i don't know the name of it but you yeah would. where the cotton row club is yeah it's and across yeah, the street you're yeah, right yeah, on yeah well um love scott beretta the king of the blues around here you know great show so you, you really you're on the trail oh yeah oh yeah we stay on the trail we are the trail. <laughs> you are, you are the trail. Well, it was it was a lot quieter out at Go Away Lodge this weekend. But you know, when we're talking food, I went old school, and you know, I love to read every morning what the New York Times recipe of the day is. Yeah. And Malcolm, it was a tuna melt. A tuna melt. Who knew wow. that the New York Times would be? Pimping. Did they use yellowfin? Uh, was it canned no, tuna? No, they, they or didn't. Fresh? It was it was really old school. But what kind of interested me, and what I wanted to tell you, that legend has it that the tuna melt was accidentally invented in the '60s hmm. at the Woolworths lunch counter in Charleston, South Carolina, and it was when a cook did not notice that a bowl of tuna salad tipped over onto the grilled cheese. Oh. And the rest is history. I Indeed mean, it, it may is. not be true, but it sounds... It sounds like uh, it sounds, it Deep sounds, South Dining. Yeah, it, sound, it sounds reasonable. But, but uh, this tuna melt had, you know, extra sharp cheddar. Of course, they had to do something different. So they used like cornichons. But uh, John Palmer, was he was pretty darn happy watching football and eating an old school tuna melt. I you lived just don't on see it. I mean, you don't see it on menus. No. Remember, Shoney's, all these people used to have used a to tuna melt. It. Well, I lived on tuna melts when I was out in California. We had them almost every night because it was what we could afford, and it was fun. You would make the sandwiches, wrap it in aluminum foil, put it in the oven, and put it on very low until it toasted, and you'd bring it out, and it was crisp and melted all the way through. We didn't cook it like a grilled cheese. We actually put it in the oven in foil. And it makes cool. a, it's a slow cook. Well, it's not a cook. It's a warm-up. Everything's already cooked. I bet it turns gooey. Very gooey and very good. Well, you know what? Let's bring the tuna melt back. Let's do it. Hey, you know, uh, with the season changing and all things being autumn, I noticed on Cooking and Coping, people were sort of talking about their favorite fall uh, recipes, their favorite fall meals. Chili was, was talked about quite a bit. But I wanted to share what my favorite autumn dish is. This, this says autumn to me. Baked apples. Baked apples. I can Is smell that a, them a, now. Is that a way of saying spiced apples? Spiced apples are a little different. You t baked apples is a whole apple cored and filled with honey or brown sugar Ooh, or okay. butter or oil or whatever you want to put in the middle. Put them in the oven and slow bake them. And uh, when they come out, they're soft and warm and gooey. And, and your house smells fantastic. Your house. Thank yes. you. Yes, your house, your house becomes smells like fall. autumn. Yes, autumn. Of course. On the phone today, we have from the Mississippi Community Cookbook Project at the University of Southern Mississippi, directors Jennifer Branock and Andrew Haley. Welcome. We are so happy to have y'all on the show this morning. Happy to be here. Ah, hello, Jennifer. Great to be talking to you, Carol Melcom. Thank you, Andrew. You've been on before. That's right. We called you once before, did we not? You and I have chatted about this subject before. But this is our first time on oh. the uh, radio with you. Oh, well, great. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Well, Jennifer nobody loves cookbooks more than Malcolm and me. We have, we have been friends for decades, and we have been collecting and swapping. And Malcolm is actually a cookbook finder. 
finder of the cookbook. That's right. I love them. And particularly the community cookbooks, which leads us to uh, tell us about the project, Jennifer, and what's going on with the community cookbook project. Sure. So probably about um, 10 years ago, um, we had a very small collection of cookbooks, probably about five or six. And uh, Andrew and I had talked about the cookbooks before and started to go on a campaign to start collecting Mississippi community cookbooks primarily. And so uh, we've been uh, collecting cookbooks for about 10 years, um, both from Mississippi, but we also collect around Louisiana and Alabama and some of the surrounding areas. Um, then, of course, along the way, people, you know, have more than just community cookbooks. So we end up taking their, um, you know, national cookbooks, Julia Child, you know, French bread cookbooks, things like that to help uh, kind of round out the collection. And how many, more or less, uh, or, or do you know exactly how many are in your collection today? We have about 5,000 titles uh, total, probably about 1,800 uh, Mississippi community cookbooks. And that's not including the different editions because we do collect all the different editions because there are different recipes and different covers and things like that. Right. Um, so, yeah. So, Andrew, uh, talk a little bit about the importance of the community cookbook and its storytelling aspect, not only the recipes, but sort of the histories that are buried within these pages. Yeah, so community cookbooks, especially in Mississippi, are a record of local life, an easily lost record of local life. And since these were usually written by women and women's groups, they were not always collected by libraries and archives as other government documents were. And so we have community cookbooks that represent towns that no longer exist or were the only publication in that community outside of maybe some government documents. Um, and in particular, they can help us understand not just how people ate, but how they lived their lives. Since most of these community cookbooks were charity, charity cookbooks, they were raising money mm -hmm. for various causes. They tell us what women in those communities, and primarily women, what women in those communities cared about in the past. Well, I'm, I'm just going to give an example of that this morning. Um, we had a caller last week. I believe it was Jesse Malcolm. He was getting ready to go squirrel hunting. Who yes. knew that squirrel season was upon us? Was upon us. I, I told Malcolm I did not know squirrel had its own season. That's right. Well, then, of course. It's Mississippi. I know, but it's a rodent. <laughs> <laughs> to some. To some. Okay. Anyway, <laughs> we talked about fried squirrel on the radio, and I went home and dug out this copy of Billy Joe Cross's Cooking Wild Game and Fish. And I owned a gourmet store for 30-something years, so, you know, was very familiar with this one. And there is a whole chapter on squirrel. And, you know, it just led me to look through this and what you're talking about, uh, talking about the life of our state. What is more Mississippi than than game? And to be able so, to go to this is, is a great resource. I will uh, expand your horizons here, Carol. Then 1958-59 Chula Garden Club cookbook, my absolute favorite page of any Mississippi cookbook. The top recipe submitted by a local white woman is for squirrel stew. And then it's followed by a recipe also submitted by a local white woman for chop suey. And the final recipe <laughs> submitted by a Syrian Lebanese immigrant is she calls it cabbage tamale, but it's really for rolled cabbage. So you have squirrel stew, chop suey, and a Lebanese dish on the same page. Chop and that suey. Is Mississippi cooking. Yeah, what wow. what a, a 50s thing. And you know, I was showing I was showing Malcolm uh, the squirrel recipes, and there are two recipes for squirrel and dumplings. I mean, really, what what a wealth and squirrel fricassee. Absolutely. Very, I mean, there's very no, continental. Yes, there's no, there's no reason to think you just have to fry a, fry a squirrel. <laughs> but I've never seen that Chula cookbook. What, what a treasure that must be. It's a remarkable cookbook. And you can see it this afternoon by going on, online because it's one of the about 150 community cookbooks that the University of Southern Mississippi now has online. So. 
Fantastic. You know, we've enjoyed some of the other, the Delta cookbooks, because the Delta cookbooks really do paint life in the Delta. And a lot of these were done in the 60s, I think, you know. India, Indianola, Inverness, Roland Fork, all those little towns. And they even go into, you know, recipes for ketchup because stores weren't that weren't that close by in some of these communities. And there were always recipes for alcoholic beverages. Always. I mean, not just stirring like martinis, but, you know, pitchers in the refrigerator like in some communities they did iced tea. So we, we always get tickled reading yeah, what was it's going re- on? It's remarkable those um, alcohol recipes since the state had statewide prohibition at the time, and yet they're still, you know, and these are often leaders of their community, but they're still publishing their 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 recipes for punch. They love their punch. So. And Jennifer, um, often these cookbooks uh, are fundraisers for congregations at churches, and uh, I know I have quite a collection of church cookbooks, community church cookbooks. So what what are some of the oldest cookbooks that you have in the collection? I think the oldest one we have is a Brookhaven cookbook from maybe 1904, I think, um, is the yeah. oldest one that we have. Is that right, Andrew? I think that's, that's right. One. We have a reprint of one from um, Woodville, Mississippi, which is probably the oldest community cookbook in Mississippi. And that was published in 1899 followed by the Laurel Cookbook, um, a kind of classic that was republished over and over again in in Laurel. And then I think the Brookhaven one, and there's one from a Presbyterian church in Gulfport from 1906. And those are the very earliest community cookbooks from Mississippi. Yeah, I remember from uh, my earlier research into this, several of those cookbooks, you know, maybe Woodville for sure, were done to raise funds for... Civil War soldiers for, you know, uh, rehabilitation and, you know, they were they were charity aimed at at that, which I, you know, I mean, just took me back to our history that women have been charitably giving and collecting for a very long time. So uh, The, the very first community cookbooks were published in the North, and and they were published by, um, the first one was published by a sanitation society, which was a a fancy name for a fund, uh, a group that raised funds for Northern soldiers. Um, And so then the Southern Mutual Aid Societies and Memorial uh, Societies, they also started publishing community cookbooks um, as well. In, In Mississippi, there's a Jackson cookbook by a a, a group very similar to the United Daughters of the Confederacy that publishes in the, I, I, I think around the early teens, um, and that raises funds for veterans of the the Confederate uh, the Civil War. Hmm. So tell our listeners um, who might be interested in donating books or uh, seeing the collection online. Sort of tell us where they can see it, how they can be involved, how they can donate books, how that's all, that process is is curated. Sure. Um, So you can just send them to, you can contact me, Jennifer Brannick at USM. And, um, you know, if you're local, we'll come get them. Um, And, uh, um, you know, we don't take, we're getting to the point now that we've got so many cookbooks that a lot of people have. So we might not be able to keep all of them but we are looking to fill in a lot of gaps whether it's new stuff or stuff from um, you know we're particularly interested in ones before 1970 um, community cookbooks Um, as far as finding them online you just go to our digital collections at in special collections at uh, Southern Miss and um, you know feel free to contact me um, with any questions are there specific- In the early days, Go ahead. Go ahead. we were so excited to get everything we could. Um, and we had some amazing donors who gave us a thousand or more cookbooks. Um, now we have to be a little bit more selective because the library is running out of room for our cookbooks. <laughs> um, but but um, we there, there are still um, older cookbooks that we are trying to locate. And one of our big objectives for years now has been to locate older African-American community cookbooks. There is not a single cookbook that we've been able to even identify by title um, published by an African-American civic group or church group. 
prior to the 1970s. Hmm. So, this was um, my, this was going to be my my next topic to a- ask you about because you know all of that history you know with the the proliferation of the junior league cookbooks that was started in the 50s and all of that with no african american cookbooks now we're seeing a proliferation of people going back and uh, doing these cookbooks i'm thinking of tony tipton morrison and the jemima code and uh, you know her books and the the black family reunion cookbook was one of the first that I sold at the Everyday Gourmet when uh, when I had it years ago. And also a writer from Mississippi named Kathy Starr did a cookbook in the, you know, in the 80s. But I, I'm just so uh, gratified to see the number of books that are coming out now that are trying to recapture some of this history because that's where a lot of the great cooking went on and also that was the cooking that was going on in the white kitchens where the women wrote wrote down the recipes and put them in their community cookbooks yeah there's a book um i wonder if it's in your collection it's not really a community cookbook but it isn't from a young african well a young african-american chef jesse's creole and deep south i think it's favorites is the top the title it was a fella in bay st louis and as you say people are for that. That's a tough one to find. I wonder if you have it in your collection. We absolutely do. Um, and it was one of those uh, original ones that were of those five or six cookbooks that uh, Jennifer mentioned that we had in the collection. It's, it's an amazing cookbook. I mean, he was he was a um, uh, young African-American man who worked for this family in Bay St. Louis, if I remember correctly. Uh, That's right. And they helped him to get training as a cook, and he became a, a very celebrated local chef. And they published this cookbook with his recipes, I think, I, and off the top of my head, in the, the late 50s or Yeah, or 58, 1960s. I believe, something uh, like 58, that. 58, that sounds right, yeah. Um, well, but it's, it's a great cookbook, very like much of southern mississippi and parts of the delta is very influenced by louisiana cooking so creole and and later cajun cooking right because they many uh, new orleans families as you know spent their uh, summers uh, in bay st louis and they had homes there and they entertained and in in this book of jesse's the forward talks about all the uh, celebrities who came to dine at their table and uh, and he's his cooking is very much influenced, as you say, by New Orleans, by the Creole recipes, because a lot of these people, uh, they traveled. There were there was no state line in those days between Bay St. Louis uh, and New Orleans and, and those cuisines travel back and forth. And it's a great this book is a great history of that. I, I think of it as the sort of Old Testament of of Gulf Coast cookery that was influenced by Mobile, New Orleans, the, the readiness, availability of seafood, and all of these uh, influences colliding at once. The Deep South. Carol, there's a lot of game recipes in there. There really are. Squirrel, yeah. <laughs> a lot I of mean, them. it's so important, uh, so important in the life of, of the state. And that's what a lot of people cooked and still cook. Stretching back to the 19th century, uh, there were lots of cookbooks that were written by black chefs, but were kind of sponsored by white patrons. Um, And this was very, this book is very much in the tradition of that. What is much rarer um, are cookbooks that are created by the black community themselves. And there may be some very good reasons for that. Um, black cooks, um, like at church festivals, for example, uh, cooked communally and the need to share recipes was not always as great. Um, other other black chefs, they were making a living from those recipes, um, uh, serving as cooks in white homes. And so giving out their secrets didn't always make sense, but there is a real scarcity of black community cookbooks um, prior to the 1970s. But the, yeah, the Junior League cookbooks and those community cookbooks are peppered with recipes like, you know, Mamie's fried chicken or, you know, giving, 
I don't know if you're giving homage or some attribution that it was somebody else in the more kitchen. More like ripping off. Yes, I think. ripping off. Carol that would be more, the description. <laughs> that, that it wasn't, uh, you know, Mrs. Malcolm White back in the kitchen <laughs> cooking. Right. That there was Mrs. Malcolm White's helper. Yeah, it was <laughs> Mrs. Malcolm White's helper doing uh, doing. All of that fine cooking. That brings me to another point. If you go to those cookbooks, it's always Mrs. Malcolm White, Mrs. John Smith. People have no names until I remember when we were working on the Junior League cookbook, Come On In, which was an award-winning cookbook, and we published under people's first names. Yeah, and I would be scandal, curious. Scandal. Yeah, scandal. I would be curious when males begin to have recipes in these community cookbooks, Jennifer. I think the, I, don't, I don't see it to maybe the eighties or nineties, and a lot of times it's kitschy, like you know, recipes for guys who cook kind of cookbooks. Yeah. Oftentimes, right. um, Andrew. Yeah, there are some rare exceptions. There's a section of a cookbook from the 1950s from Forrest um, in Mississippi that has an opening section um, of men's recipes, which turn out to be a couple of game recipes and a lot of, and I can't explain why, um, uh, New Orleans style cooking um, Hmm. and a couple of desserts. Uh, but that is the exception. Occasionally, a man makes his way into one of these cookbooks. There's a cookbook from, um, um, I'm trying to remember the community now, uh, it, but it is a cookbook that includes an Italian recipe um, and for spaghetti. But the gentleman who submitted it, he was an Italian born in New Jersey, um, came to Mississippi with the Works Progress Administration, uh, mm-hmm. got married to a local Mississippi girl. Um, and, yeah, you know, he wanted to share his particular expertise, Italian cooking. And so his recipe for spaghetti appears in it. Um, but it, that is that is one of the kind of rare exception. That was a cookbook. I can't think of the name of it right now, but it's from Waynesboro. So. Waynesboro. Wow. Over by the Alabama line. All right, we're There's take- almost no place in Mississippi that doesn't have a community. Cookbook. Well, as it should be. We are here on this beginning of fall, late October uh, Monday. Uh, welcome back, Jennifer Brannock and Andrew Haley from the University of Southern Mississippi's Mississippi Community Cookbook Project. And we invite our listeners, if you have a favorite community cookbook you want to share or a recipe from one, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, if not, um, We'll continue our conversation uh, with Jennifer and Andrew. Uh, Andrew, what are some of the memorable stories uh, that you've come across in doing all of this research that you could share with our listeners? Sure. I mean, what really fascinates me about these community cookbooks is the way that they are, they, they subtly transform the communities they're in. Um, so if we go to a place like a Calhoun City, um, uh, north of Jackson, in the hills, there is a community cookbook that comes out in the 1960s, around 1960, and it's, it's done to raise money for a school trip um, at the local high school. Um, and you look at the cookbook and it has some great recipes, but they're relatively simple. There's a lot of casseroles. Sometimes there's instructions to spouses and family members on how to, you know, take it out of the freezer um, and prepare it. Um, and it's understandable because this is the community that in the post-World War II era had transformed from a lumber furniture making community to a community where suddenly women are working in great numbers. A pants factory opens up as part of an initiative in Mississippi to spur on the economy. And suddenly women who are at home are working and they need foods that their families can prepare. They can prepare in advance and put in the freezer and they're taking advantage of it. And so these cookbooks give us a little bit of a glimpse on how those communities are changing and adapting to that change. 
Yeah. Uh, while we were on break, I looked up. There was an article that Mississippi writer Larison Campbell did a couple of years ago on her mother's cookbook collection. Her mother had boxed up these cookbooks and sent them to her in New York. And she hit on a subject that we were just talking about, about how do men get their names in a cookbook. And it says women's names were on everything except when it came to hard alcohol. <laughs> and then, and then it was uh, the husband's name, and she uh, she repeats this recipe for the refrigerator martini. Ah, it is yes. under the husband's name: two parts gin, one part vodka, measured in cups, not ounces. <laughs> the cocktail can be mixed in an empty fifth bottle, as its name suggests, stored in the refrigerator. Rather than suggesting we'll serve twelve. To remind the reader not to drink it alone, the instructions simply read, we'll keep as long as they last. Wow. Java, what as, is your... As a histor- oh, sorry. As a historian, it is immensely frustrating when you're trying to figure out who these people are and you don't have the woman's first names. You just have their husband's right. names. <laughs> it has um, to be. Interesting. Java, what is your first uh, sort of interaction with the community cookbook? I, I know we sit around here and talk about them all the time, but when did you first see your first one and what do you remember about it? I can't I can't recall, I guess, when I first saw my first one, but I know it has to do with my grandmother's house because the one thing that I can remember about these, um, now that I know our community cookbooks, they are, you know, they were just printed out on this kind of, I don't know, not really hard paper, but it wasn't thin, you know, paper either. And they were always under on the spiral, had the spiral uh-huh, um, right. spine. And I always thought that was interesting. And it kind of just indicated to me, like, this is a cookbook, the spiral spine and the, um, you know, and, and, and that kind of special paper. I wish I had a name for it, but it was, I guess it was to... Uh, handle splatter and being in the ki- in the uh, kitchen a little bit, you. You a know. utilitarian type paper. Uh, there you go, <laughs> Andrew. Do you or Jennifer have comments about the paper that in the early cookbooks with the, might have had? Well, I I don't know much about the paper to be honest, but those spiral bindings are, are a classic part of the community cookbook. And when I'm in a bookstore, I scan the shelves for those spiral bindings because I know they're going to be community cookbooks. Um, many community cookbooks in the 20s, 30s, 40s were printed locally and put together by people in the community. They would sell advertisements to local businesses to raise the money to print the cookbook and then print the cookbook for profit for the charitable right. group. By the 50s, late 50s and 60s, more and more of this is being done by national corporations that specialize in the printing of community cookbooks. Um, and that's probably where the special paper gets introduced. And I know from reading many and perusing many more that there's often uh, the publisher or the printer is this corporation who goes around and says, hey, how would your church congregation like to have a cookbook? Or, hey, how would your organization like to have a fundraiser? And we can facilitate that. And often there'll even be a rip out coupon in the back of the book for these companies who do this type of service for for these communities. In the 1950s, they would send representatives to your hometown and they would stay with a member of a club or or, uh, organization and actually kind of help you get started, right? Facilitate it uh, for you. Great. We've got a couple of callers. Let's go to the phone lines now. Brandon is calling from Pontotoc, Mississippi. Hello, Brandon. Hi. How are you guys? We are well, thank you. you. Yeah, you sound great. Uh, Well, you know, I'm just so excited to hear this program because I am a huge cookbook fan. I have had, at one time, over 500 myself, um, but unfortunately they burned in a house fire, but I've collected Uh. more since then. Um, And I think it's really amazing how, you know, when you look at cookbooks, um, you, you, you find things in them sometimes that you don't expect, where people come in and write or change recipes and also insert recipes from magazines or newspapers or products that they purchased. And I just love the fact that there's so many different types. I know that I've got several that are 
better cookbooks that came with products that people, uh, companies sold uh-huh. back in the 1950s and 60s. A lot of times when you'd buy a cooking, uh, right. one of these new cooking appliances, you would find that it would come with a cookbook. And, um, and, uh, and the uh, the microwave ones are interesting. I don't use microwave any longer, but <laughs> they had some pretty interesting things that they did. But the other thing I want to say is that a lot of times, I think anyway, I know my family did see this, uh, compile their own cookbook for the family that Absolutely. they give out at Christmas. Or, and uh, a lot of times those will have histories and photographs of home places and um, a lot of extemporaneous type of information that, you know, is really neat to look at. So That's great. I just wanted yeah. to add those. Yeah, so that's great. Y'all keep it up. This is wonderful. Great show. Yeah, well, thanks a lot. Uh, that That's good. You know, we were, a couple of weeks ago, we were talking about how the microwave uh, is the most antiquated tool in the kitchen. It hasn't evolved hardly at all, while the range and the refrigerator and the you know, Cuisinart, all of this stuff has evolved, and there's always a new version of it. The microwave just continues to be the, the microwave. Hit 30 seconds. Hit 30 seconds, you know, and it... But I do remember getting cookbooks uh, with new appliances. I guess that's quite a thing. Do y'all collect those as well? We do have a handful of them here and there because they just come in with stuff and we, you know, started collecting, especially early on. We didn't know what we were going to get, so we just kept it all. <laughs> right. Well, that's... We do have those, yeah. All right, we got Jennifer a... is a huge fan of those uh, corporate cookbooks, and we have some. Um, they're, they're often hilarious. Um, yeah, very and, often uh, hilarious. Really entertaining. <laughs> Not meant to be, but... but... You know, <laughs> We think of, we have a tendency to romanticize the cooking of the past, and we imagine that the community cookbooks are cover to cover, you know, Southern cooking and classic dishes. But in reality, people shared the food that they were eating, and often those were recipes they got from newspapers or magazines or these corporate cookbooks, and those show up uh, regularly and are part of every everybody's lives. Yeah. Um, and there are certainly recipes that are include products by the brand name Campbell's Soup or, you know, um, uh, a cracker company's particular recipes, because that's that's what people were making and that's what they wanted others to know they were making. Right. We've also got a caller uh, in Meridian, Mississippi. Raymond is on the phone. Hello, Raymond. How are you? Hey, how are you doing? Great. I just want to just want to tell Andrew that some of the Haley cookbooks are collected by my sister. Uh, her name is uh, uh, Brenda Hayes, and uh, she now lives in Texas, but she collects uh, the, the cookbooks from the Haley family. Oh, from the Haley family. Well, I, I'd love yeah, to say that the- those are... are- are, are my family. Um, I have grown to love Mississippi greatly, and I try to know everything I can about Mississippi cooking, but I'm a uh, northerner from New Hampshire myself uh, originally, and so that's where my particular Haley strand comes from. Um, so I don't know if those would be my family cookbooks, but family cookbooks are fascinating, and it's something that we didn't consciously collect in the early days, but we've placed a lot more emphasis in recent years. In some ways, with the internet, community cookbooks may be a dying phenomena, but family cookbooks, cookbooks that people put together to celebrate their own family recipes and their handed down recipes, that's a burgeoning part of the cookbook industry, I think. Yeah, I think you're right. You hear more and more about families collecting grandma's or grandpa's recipes putting them in a little book for the family to have a copy of because everybody always wants to know you know who has the dumpling recipe who has the bread pudding recipe who has the meatball and spaghetti recipe and it's like oh so and so got that one or so and so got that one and then there's this like well let's put them all together so everyone can share uh in the family recipes got yeah, another- that's one of the family- oh, sorry no go you're good and we- that's one of the things with the um, with the community cookbooks is that, you know, there are lost family recipes that are found in there. So I've had coworkers who have gone through and remembered their mother's treasured orange cake, and they were able to find that in a cookbook. And it was something that a lot of people come to us because their parents, their mothers put their those recipes in there. 
And as we've been able to digitize those cookbooks, um, we can search them electronically, which allows us to track down people's family recipes um, or specific recipes you remember that your neighbor made when you were a kid and you haven't had for years. We might be able to locate this. Yeah. Well, it's a great resource, of course, and uh, I I assume uh, that it is open to the public. Anyone can go in and and gain access to these books and recipes and and it's all digitized and all online now so they don't even have to come to Hattiesburg to USM I mean they can literally go online right yeah we have the older ones about 150 of the older ones online the pre-1970s and then um, everything we have is available for people to use so if anybody you know wants to come here (laughs) we're open Monday through Friday from 9 to 4 (laughs) you'd be happy to have them (laughs) <laughs> exactly. We'd love to have them. <laughs> All right. We got another caller from Oxford, Mississippi. It's it's our buddy Chico Harris. Hello, Chico. What's up? Hey, I, I wanted to offer this. It's for anyone that's interested in uh, publishing a cookbook or any book, there is a very fine company. Um, about 12 years ago, I, I researched printers from Baltimore to Beijing. And the best one I found with the quickest turnaround, the less expensive price, and the best quality product is a group of Mississippi people. They're Ole Miss people. The company is in Collierville, Tennessee, right over the state line. But they do a fantastic job with, like I said, great turnaround, great price, and a great product. I recommend them to anyone. And And, they're good people from Mississippi. and, And who are they, Chico? It's instantpublisher.com. Okay. Is the way to contact them, instantpublisher.com. The website is the best website of its kind I've ever seen. They make it super easy for you to give them their book, and they give you exactly what you give them. You don't have to worry about a thing. So if any of our listeners are contemplating publishing their own cookbook, and this is a tip on a, a publishing house from Chico, uh, instantpublisherpublishing.com, what is it? Publisher. Publisher. Instant okay. publisher. Yeah. Dot com. I, I think books often books, which is great you, you can need, just pick up the books need a company to um, help you out and get, get, get things over the line and get things printed. But I have to tell you, some of the most wonderful cookbooks in the collection are ones that were completely created locally and printed by a local printer, um, handwritten copies like a cookbook that we have out of uh, uh, Columbia um, or Columbus. Sometimes I get confused. Um, and uh, Or we have a cookbook that was presented as a wedding present that was put together by an entire community in uh, Loosedale. Uh, and these are just gorgeous. And the single prettiest cookbook um, in the collection comes from Shelby in the early 1960s. They actually sent this cookbook to uh, be printed in Great Britain. Um, it is on uh, kind of heavy textured stock paper. It's all a kind of uh, light mint green and has these beautiful modernist hand drawings throughout. It's just a lovely cookbook to look at. So while I appreciate these cookbooks for their recipes, many of these are works of art. Many of them are illustrated by local people who drew pictures of the food or drew pictures of community members or the local church. Um, so they they can be enjoyed on these multiple levels. Some of them have local histories that were written by members of the community or histories of the organization that put out the cookbook. Um, so while the recipes are st- always going to be the core of these cookbooks, they can bring us pleasure in multiple ways. Now, Jennifer, Andrew, um, you may have answered this earlier in the conversation, but how do you guys get the books for your collection? And can people um, bring books to you guys to be archived? And do they get those books back? I don't know. Just talk about that process a little bit. Sure. So probably about 99% of the books we have are through donations. And so we've had people as far as Virginia. We took a U-Haul to Virginia and picked up 4,000 cookbooks one time for, for one donor. Wow, it, was, it was from Mississippi. And that was a, it was a lot of real treasures. And um, um, so, yeah, you can just, um, you know, I have people who mail me. If there's one copy, they'll mail them to me, or we can go pick them up if it's local or near local. <laughs> we like a good road trip. So, um, and um, 
Yeah, and then we, um, you know, keep hold of them. And if they're early, we try to make them available online if we can. It's always best to uh, contact Jennifer about this. If I get hold of them, they stay in my office for you know, a year while I'm I'm looking through them. So um, Jennifer is just a master at ensuring that they get processed and available to the public quickly and efficiently. So. Well, oftentimes people will get in touch with Carol uh, or I and want to donate books. So now we've been sort of stumped about what to do with this these offers of people mail me books, you know, because we have a show about cooking and cookbooks. And so now we have this great partner. Uh, and as we receive copies of these community books, we will certainly forward them on to you. And we would encourage our listeners to do the same. If you have multiple copies or if you have old community cookbooks you don't use anymore or are just stored in a box in the attic, now they can have a home, a prominent home uh, in the special collections uh, at the University of Southern Mississippi, alongside <laughs> the great de Grauman collection of children's literature and children's books there at USM. Yeah, that's right. I think it's important to note that, um, uh, you know, a number of archives in the state were like us. They had a few community cookbooks that had often been kind of accidentally acquired, right? They acquired the papers of a governor, and along with that governor came his <laughs> wife's cookbooks. The governor's papers came the wife's cookbook. Um, this is the first collection of Mississippi cookbooks um, in the state, um, and the most comprehensive collection um, in the state, and really if you look across the United States, Mississippi now has one of the best collection of its community cookbooks of any state in the union. There are some other great collections, but we really have an amazing collection. And as Jennifer pointed out, it's because people in the community wanted to support this initiative and provided us with the cookbooks. Well, I think it's an incredible uh, resource for the state, uh, for people who are interested in culinary, cooking, uh, history and story. And it's so great now, Andrew, to know that we have a culinary historian. Who knew? I'm so excited about this. So as I told you the time I called you, I, now I have someone I can call and ask questions when people stump Deep South Dining. So we are so glad. Well, as, as, as you may have guessed, I just love talking about this. Um, so <laughs> I'm always available to chat about food and Mississippi food. And for, for me as an outsider, although I've been here nearly 20 years, I'm still learning a lot. So. Did, you, uh, did you get your degrees from USM or did you move around and just end up ultimately... Uh, in I Pittsburgh. got my PhD at the University of Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. So I've been I've been moving south slowly, New Hampshire, <laughs> Pittsburgh, Mississippi. So. All right, Jennifer, what are what are some of the newer the newest newer books that you've collected that you found? And I don't know. The are people still producing the community cookbook like they used to? They are. They are. They're not um, in the volume that they used to. So we do. Um, uh, occasionally get when people publish new ones, they'll send them our way. Or if we're out and about looking around, we might find uh, some for sale at various bazaars or things like that. Um, I also use eBay a good bit to look around to see what's available there. Um, so I'm always on the on the hunt. <laughs> yeah, I, I would imagine yard sales would be a great place to, to gather some community cookbooks. They are. And of course, you have the, the women who most of these cookbooks belong to are getting older and their families don't want them. Any, you know, they're not going to people rarely look through cookbooks much anymore. You know, they go online. So to be able to have a home for them, I think, really makes many people feel feel good about but, it. But it's also why it's really important to us to have. Um, to, 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 to talk to your audience, right, because while when it comes to yard sales, I can't go up to northern Mississippi every weekend uh, looking through yard sales and we're located right. in the south. And while our collection is uh, spans the entire state of Mississippi, it's just harder for us to to go to the yard sale. So readers go to the yard sale. All right. And then pass them on to you. Them our way. All right. Thanks a million. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate the conversation. We will continue to promote the collection and remind you that Deep South Dining is a production of Mississippi Public Broadcasting's Think Radio. We are funded by generous contributions from listeners like yourself. We thank you. Our show is produced by Java Chapman. For my co-host, Carol Palmer. 
And for our special guests, Jennifer Branock and Andrew Haley, I'm Malcolm White saying please stay tuned for Marshall Ramsey's program. Follow it right now. This is an MPB Think Radio podcast. To hear previous shows, visit mpbonline.org or download the MPB Public Radio app to listen on your iPhone or Android phone on demand.